Welcome to the Victoria Anarchist Book Fair's week of podcasts featuring local, national, and international activists and authors. Due to the ongoing global pandemic, the Book Fair Collective decided to move their event online again this year. So for the second year in a row, From Embers is teaming up with the Victoria Anarchist Book Fair to release presentations over our podcast platform. Recordings of these Voices of Resistance were conducted on unceded Indigenous territories across so-called British Columbia and beyond. For more information about the book fair and a full schedule of online events this week, check out victoriaanarchistbookfair.ca and listeners in the Victoria area are encouraged to visit Camus Books at 2620 Quadra Street or online at camus.ca for anarchist publications and more. And to find out more about our regular anarchist podcast, go to fromembers.libsyn.com or simply search From Embers in your favorite podcast app. First off, I'd like to acknowledge my half of this interview is taking place on unceded, occupied Lekwungen territory in what colonial Canada calls Victoria, British Columbia. The other half of this interview, shared with us today by Sarah Marsha, who is joining us in, in Europe. Sarah Marcha is from the Genealogy Academy. Genealogy is the revolutionary science of women's equality developed in the autonomous territories of Rojava in northern Syria. Since 2016, Sarah has participated in many different genealogy research and education projects in Europe and in the Middle East. Thank you for joining me today, Sarah. I really appreciate you taking the time to answer some of my questions about the women's movement in Rojava. But first of all, for those listeners who are just learning about Rojava, could you please provide a short overview of democratic confederalism as a path to self-determination for those in your region? Hello to everybody. Thank you very much to invite me to speak today. So, as you know, Rojava, it's a part of uh, a territory that uh, we can call Kurdistan, uh, a territory where, where Kurdish people was living since a long, long, long time, all their history. And uh, unfortunately, after the First uh, World War, uh, like at the end of the Ottoman Empire, like the British and French colonial power divided this territory in four parts. Uh, one part is now in the Turkish uh, state, one part in the Iranian state, one part in the Iraqi state, and one part in the Syrian state. So when we speak about Rojava, Rojava is in the north of Syria. Uh, this is a, a region where there are a lot of Kurds, but also Arab Arabs people, like also um, like different Christian also peoples, there is a lot of diversity there. And so since uh, the end of the 70s, like the Kurdish uh, movement for uh, national liberation appear uh, also with the fight of the PKK, so the uh, Kurdish uh, Workers' Party, and um, this uh, was at the beginning like a, a fight for a uh, free Kurdistan uh, and to establish like a socialist uh, state, we can say. The leader of the PKK in that time, uh, Abdullah Ojaran, that is still until today, but is since more than 22 years in a prison in Turkey, uh, was step by step like uh, putting the woman liberation also inside uh, the, the issue of the national liberation and the woman played a very important role to, to the liberation uh, and in the guerrilla but also in the social works and organization and uh, in the end of the 90s when uh, Abdullah Ojanan was captured by an international complot made by uh, United States like Israel, uh, Turkey and all, all European country also, he realized that we cannot speak about freedom uh, in the state system. Because the state is by itself a problem, because the state is making every time this uh, power relationship between people. So it developed like the, uh, 
democratic confederalism in that moment, which is like more like um, decentralized system made by commune and by popular assembly, by people assemblies, where uh, women's uh, liberation, ecology, and democracy are the three pillars. And so uh, when the Syrian civil war starts in 2011, like the Kurdish people and all the people of the Rojava region decide to make the revolution to push away like the uh, Syrian regime and also to fight against, against the invasion of Daesh in that time, like uh, Islamic State, and they build their own uh, projects, their own revolution, where there is like the system of the people and also in parallel an autonomous system of women. So recently a new term has in entered my lexicon and I was hoping you could explain it for us. Uh, what is genealogy? Is it an ethos, a practice, or both? Like uh, genealogy, like it's part of uh, this revolution. It's part of the Kurdistan revolution, but also for all the women from all the different people's origin, beliefs, and places in the world. It's, uh, it's a science. It's a science of the woman. It's a science of the life. Because when we speak about women, we don't speak just about gender or gender struggle. But we think about uh, women as the roots of society, as the roots of life, and that they can, uh, we have to see like uh, the role of women for liberation of women, society, and nature also in an ecological uh, way. So the mission of genealogy is to build knowledge inside the system of the revolution for the people and for the women. Like the aim of genealogy is to find what are the roots of the problem that we are facing in 21st century because of sexism, because of patriarchy, because of colonialism, because of capitalism, dogmatism, liberalism, etc. And so to analyze this problem in a local way and in a global way to understand how we can overcome this mentality, this dominant mentality, and what we can provide in, uh, like we can say, in terms of ethics, in terms also of organization, of project, in order to build a more equal society. How did you get involved with the Genealogy Academy? So the Genealogy Academy, actually, it's uh, like, uh, we can say like the umbrella organization all of all our genealogy work. So we have different structure in Rojava, in the first uh, parts of Kurdistan also, and also uh, as I am now uh, in Europe. So I start to know genealogy in the conference uh, in Paris. Uh, they were like in 2016, like a, a Paris genealogy conference, and where uh, Kurdish women and women from different parts of uh, Europe also came to share the perspective of genealogy. And I realized that in that time I was uh, involved in, um, we can say like a sympathizant in anarchist and feminist uh, and anti-colonial uh, struggles. And I realized that we did as European movement, like leftist movement, a lot of analysis of sexism and of uh, capitalism, but a lot of time we are weak in how to provide a um, solution to it. For me, was bringing as uh, a solution how we can not just fight against the system, but build a new system. Can you speak to some of the social and communal structures you are building to change society? For example, I've heard of women's houses, but I don't know what they are. Yes, so, like, um, so, as I said, like, as Genealogy, we are building different autonomous structures. Some structures are in Rojava. I also participated to it in the uh, Andrea Wolf Institute. And uh, all the structures, for example, in Rojava are connected to all the women's system. And uh, like uh, some, what we are doing, it's like to be connected with the autonomous system of women. So for example, there are uh, women's houses, that they are uh, women, that they are trying to solve the problem of the women in the society. 
For example, when there is a problem of justice, for example, her uh, father wants to force to marry his daughter, or a family wants to force to marry uh, their daughter, or for example, a woman is facing violence by her husband or someone else in the society, or for example, a woman wants to divorce. And all these uh, like social issues, like linked to uh, women's freedom and, and women's uh, rights, uh, it's, it will be in the women's houses that women can find uh, uh, support. And uh, a mediation will be done to try to solve the different problems, to try to change the mentality of the society. So, for example, as uh, genealogy structures um, in Rojava, we will be in contact with the women's houses in order to know what are the problems of the woman in the daily life. And so, through that, we will uh, also analyze uh, which perspective we can give to each other in order to solve uh, the problem in the best way. So, for example, sometimes a woman wants to divorce, for example, because the, the, uh, they have economical problems, so inside the, the family, like, the situation is getting bad, and so violence is also coming out. But sometimes the solution, it's not uh, just the fact to divorce. The problem, it's an economical problem. The problem, it's like how you build uh, love inside the society, how you build, like, that we, build, we will uh, consider each other, how you will build also, like, uh, for example, economical uh, autonomy, autonomy for women, for example. So we're trying to not just uh, find a way to solve a symptom, but to find the way to solve the real problem in a deep, deep, deep way. So this is the work, for example, we are doing in uh, genealogy linked to this uh, issue. Or, for example, for about suicide of women, no? because sometimes the problem is not just violence, but because you want to escape to a, a bad situation, you decide to put end to your life. So I will give the woman the strength to confront themselves to the problem, to organize themselves, to not face this problem alone, but to come to participate to the different organization, political work, social work, edu educational work, and so as genealogy, we will analyze what are the needs of the woman in order to uh, build education, formation, trainings, etc. Um, can you discuss some examples of gender struggles that have found transformation under democratic confederalism? Yes, uh, for example, you have the system of co-presidents. So uh, in Rojava, but not just in Rojava, Everywhere where you have uh, Kurdish uh, people organized or different people as Arabs, as I said, no, Turkmen or Christian people, SD people, etc. Uh, in each level of the organization of the society, there are a system of co-chair. So one man and one woman will be with the same responsibility uh, in order, for example, to be the uh, spokesperson of a committee, of a commune, or etc. And so this uh, is why it's for make the gender struggle like in a practice inside the society. So the women have their own autonomous system. They organize by themselves. They take their own decision. And after this decision, these issues are bring in the general structures in the structure of all society. So the woman that will be the co-chair with a man, she will bring, she will represent the will of the woman, the decision of the woman, and she will bring it there. Also, she will have to uh, work as a comrade with the male friend. And so the male friend will have also to accept her to accept her point of, uh, her point of view, to uh, try to um, find a way to create an um, equal relationships, etc. It's not easy, but uh, sometimes, for example, uh, like it's bringing really the struggle in a deep way. First, when, for example, before women were not listening, what the woman said, what the woman said, they were not listening now. Because of the system, men have to uh, listen to them and to accept the decision of the woman. 
from one part. But also another way, for example, a woman told us that before the system of culture was uh, put in practice, she was the spokesperson. So she was like leading, we can say, her society. Uh, and uh, when after the revolution, when the system was built and established, uh, so a man came also. And she said, but I don't need the man. I can do it by myself because I was doing it before and it was working. But uh, the system is saying, no, we have to do it together. So at the beginning, she had a really, really a lot of problem because of this main mentality. Like uh, men not listening, making what they want, as they want, and stuff. So she was telling the friend, oh, but my situation is worse than before with this system. But the friend tell her, the female friend tell her, no, you have to fight because you have to change him. You have to change his mentality. We have to change together his mentality. So we have to make the gender struggle, not just to make our things by ourselves as women, because we can build our way of working, but if we not change the main mentality, we cannot change the society. And so uh, with a lot of struggle, at the end, these two cultures could uh, like work together and understand each other and also like love each other as comrades, as comrades that they will work together for the transformation of their society for building a revolution. And so in that way, today, this woman, she said, I did the gender struggle as a deep uh, things. This is an example of the system, but there are other, other examples. For example, women that before in their family, for example, with their husband, uh, they, they were facing like sometimes psychological violence or they were like, they didn't have had any like values in the society because they were seen as just women with without will, without an active role in society, just the traditional work in the house as a mother, etc. This woman she said that after the revolution start and the system of uh, democratic confederalism was built, she started working in the system. No, she started involved in politics, in social issue. She get education, trainings, etc. Also, her husband was entering in the world and also uh, receiving a different way of thinking, like what means equality what means like to work together and what is the strength of the woman also. After a while, the man came to, to, the, to his wife and he said to her, I am sorry, I treat you very, very, very bad all these years. Now I realize it, I believe in you, I love you, and I want to make all the work as you want with the society, we will do it, we will do it for our people, and also we will change our way of uh, live in the family, that will be, we will also be democratic. So for example, this woman, she said, all my life changed after the system was done because the mentality of my husband and my mentality changed. I understand that many acts of self-governance occur with men and women's councils organizing parallel based upon what you were saying. What about individuals who may be gender non-conforming? Where are such individuals situated within Rojava's institutions? So in Rojava, uh, we can say that as like we can, uh, people that they are organized, are we know, for example, uh, as we know in uh, other countries, uh, this issue, it's not uh, like a visible issue now, uh, because also like um, like uh, a lot of way are open that everybody can participate to the social social work, political work, and the life, and also discussing about a different topic against sexism, again like a traditional view. Uh, so in Rojava, uh, it's not it's not an issue in the daily life, and also like uh, there are uh, different uh, way of making uh, the work on uh, gender uh, struggle. But for sure, as genealogy work that we are in different part of Kurdistan, in different part of Middle East, and also in Europe, and different also part of the world. Uh, we, of course, have every time this uh, discussion, this uh, debate about what means 
uh, women's freedom and what means to fight with a woman identity, but at the same time, how diversity, how everybody can have a place in the way of uh, the general revolution. So we have uh, actually two, like uh, we can say, like um, way of uh, discussion. The first one is what happened, what is the history and the social uh, construction of the woman in uh, in uh, our uh, oppression for sure, but also as an identity of struggle. But at the same time, also. Uh, what is the diversity that is existing in society in the world? And when we speak about diversity, we don't speak about uh, just gender. We speak about the different way of beliefs, of living, how we uh, try to have a better understanding and holistic understanding of the life linked to women, society, uh, nature, universe. So all this uh, like um, debate, we have it. Now, also, what we want is not to, to just discuss about this topic, but really like that we can try to organize together, to organize together, to feel each other also, and that uh, also to not let, like, every time the state or the difference in political view or different struggles that can sometimes divide us, but at the contrary, to try to have uh, like different meeting in the, inside the different structure, inside the different parts of the world, that, that we can uh, like uh, have a positive discussion, that we can build our autonomy without to exclude anybody, uh, but also uh, not rejecting the woman identity. Uh, and seeing the woman identity also as a possibility of freedom. Uh, what role does self-defense play in the struggle for women's liberation in Rojava? You know, in Rojava, uh, self-defense is everywhere. It's in every minute. It's in everything. Uh, so for sure, we have, uh, like, there are the, um, uh, uh, people defend units. Uh, as uh, YPG, YPJ, uh, that are the most known uh, outside a lot of time. But also there are civilian um, units of self-defense for the cities, for the neighborhoods, that they are uh, women and men, uh, that they are taking part of the physical uh, defense, we can say, of, the, of their territory. But also, and self-defense, it's also inside the mentality. For example, uh, all the system of education that uh, as Kurdish people or are different people of the Middle East or of the world, that you will know who you are, from where you come, what is your origin. You can speak your own language. Um, you can also know what is a part of your uh, tradition of your culture that is something that has been imposed by the states and by the dominant system, or that is something that is existing uh, since uh, thousands of years that it was built by the society for uh, the good way of living of the society. So uh, when uh, it's very linked to ethics, for example, that you will not live because someone tell you what you have to do, but you will really reflect about what you need for a good life, for a beautiful life. And so this, it's also kind of self-defense because you will not let someone else, for example, an hegemonical power or another people or another person that want to dominate you, that to tell you who you are, what you have to do, and like this, in order to manipulate you. So this is also, for example, self-defense. Uh, also, to build organization, it means not to be alone, but to make everything as collective, as social, and mostly as women, that uh, you will every time, like this is also self-defense, because uh, you will face uh, all the attacks that can be 
physical, it can be psychological, it can be by, by the medias, it can be uh, economical attacks, etc. But you can uh, build your own system that the attack of, this, of the capitalist system, colonial system or sexist system will not affect you. Or uh, it, it will affect you, but uh, you are something that you don't need this system. So you can fight against it better. So this is also the, the self-defense uh, view in, uh, in Rojava. Uh, and in the, we can say in the Kurdish woman liberation uh, movement in general. And also to say that uh, every time we have to try to build a coherence, like um, in between ethic and aesthetic, it's mean, what are the principles of society and woman that makes that we can build an equal and uh, symbiotic relationship between woman, society, and nature, and how we will put it in practice in our life. It means how we will build really a beautiful life, but not a beautiful life as uh, as women we have to be beautiful that then for the eyes, eyes of the men or for the system that they are putting a lot of pressure on of us. No, no, our own beauty. What is to be a free woman? What is to be a free society? What is to, uh, to uh, make the nature that she can be free also? This is the idea. And so self-defense is linked uh, to that, and it's also how to change the situation and our relationship to uh, break this ecological crisis and to uh, make that the life will continue, that the life will every time make a uh, revival. And uh, this is also uh, the aim of the self-defense in Rojava. Thank you. You really, uh, you really demonstrate how it's very all-encompassing, and that's really important um, to keep in mind. It's not just in certain situations, but it's the whole mentality. Um, my next question: Can you speak to the value placed on nature and the natural world and the actualization of the work that is being done in Rojava? Yes. Actually, uh, today it's the most important challenge in Rojava because, uh, as I said, like there is a lot of attacks uh, and uh, there are a lot of ecological attacks also. For example, um, during the Syrian regime time, so before the revolution, uh, the Syrian regime uh, almost cut all the forests, for example, uh, to make monoculture of uh, wood and so this make a huge huge effect on the life and ecological life in rojava for it and the nature so now for now for example everywhere uh, the self-administration it's planting trees but in order to make these trees growing you need water and Turkey, that it's every time trying to continue their invasion in the um, Rojava territory and north and east uh, Syrian territory that has been liberated, uh, like they every time cut the water, then the people cannot uh, make anything growing and so making a lot, a lot of obstacle to the life of the people and to the revolution for sure. So this is a huge, huge problem today. For sure, also, there is a huge embargo. So, like, Turkey is closing the border, and uh, they built, actually, a wall in between uh, the Kurdistan region of, uh, that is in the Turkish state and Rojava. And also, like, uh, the border with the South Kurdistan part that is in Iraq, a lot of time when they want to put the pressure, political pressure, to the self-administration, they cut also uh, the um, pass in between uh, the two countries. So there are a lot of p difficulties to make, for example, ecological uh, material passing, like crossing the border. And this is another problem. Uh, and for sure the war, no? Like 
the one it's making that electricity every time it's difficult to have because of the water also uh, but also like uh, that uh, um, like the uh, you know like the um, nature also it's uh, getting dirty because of the of the bombing because of all these materials that are used to attack the people so this is also a disaster uh, like a natural disaster but uh, the way now in Rojava is to try to build the autonomy in terms of uh, agriculture, of uh, like also like making, for example, the houses with natural um, like material. Uh, in the women movement, there are there is the project of Jinwar, which is a woman village, and so it's a village built by women uh, in a democratical and ecological way. So the women have their own assemblies and they make, for example, their, their own wheat, like they have agriculture, they have a garden, uh, they make their bread, they have their animals, as uh, they try to build like, um, like symbiotic life and autonomous life that they will not depend from the outside also. It takes time, uh, because for sure a garden, you need some years that it will work. Um, also, you need to bring new, like the knowledge that sometimes has been lost in some parts. So you need to be cre creative, and so it's step by step that is uh, they are building this project. But it's making a very very good result, and it's becoming also like an influence. It's having an influence in the old territories. So everywhere, uh, women and also social uh, cooperatives are uh, big. Uh, but for sure, our now uh, emergency is to stop the war. Because the war is every time putting a lot of obstacles, and the ecological situation is getting worse and worse. Also, for example, depending on the um, petrol and etc., because there is petrol in Rojava, but in order, like, you need to use this petrol because of the situation, difficult situation, uh, but also the way to transform the petrol. Uh, it's uh, not so um, uh, clean, we can say. So now, if we want to defend also the ecological system there, we need to defend the revolution and to stop the, the war and the embargo and all the international pressure, that uh, political pressure that they try to uh, break uh, this revolution. So... Thank you, Sarah, for making yourself available to answer my questions. Um, is there anything else you would like us to know? Yes, I wanted also to say that uh, a lot of time, for sure, we want to speak a lot about everything that is working well in Rujan, because really it's bringing hope and for us it's bringing a lot of perspective. But also I wanted to say that there are a lot of difficulties, like the way to free women's to change mentality, it's very difficult. It's not something that it's happening in one day. Uh, the revolution, it's a long-term revolution. It's not just the moment that you take your autonomy because every time you will be attacked by the system so you can lose this autonomy. The male dominant mentality also can every time like make attacks and uh, try to make uh, obstacle to the revolution, so it's a long-term uh, revolution. But what is very important, and I think we can learn from our uh, Kurdish friends, it's like to say the revolution and specifically the women's liberation, we don't have to let it for after the revolution, but it's starting now and everywhere where we are, we have to organize as women, we have to bring, to build our knowledge, we have to understand what are our problems to bring proposal of solution to put it in practice together. And in that way, uh, we will really make a change and we will win as revo revolutionary democratical forces against all patriarchy, sexist and colonial powers. Um, I'm curious to know, where can people go to get more information? Is there an internet address that you could provide us? Yes, for sure. Uh, if you want to contact us, uh, you can contact us by our uh, genealogy webpage, which is genealogy.org. 
uh, in internet. Uh, also, uh, in connected to Europe, but also different parts of the world, we have the Genealogist Center that we can also uh, contact us. So, Genealogist Center at riseup.net. Uh, and uh, we, we can get in touch also, maybe also with the uh, book fair. You can also make the link. Uh, we will be very happy. And uh, really, we are very happy to, to participate to this, to this podcast. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you so much for being, being here and sh sharing your knowledge and your research. Um, I'll definitely uh, make sure that we have these connections in the show notes so that anybody who's interested can, can reach out to you. Hello, and welcome to We Will Remember Freedom, a monthly podcast of anarchist fiction. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. Hello, and welcome to Live Like the World is Dying, your podcast for what feels like the end times. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. Hello, and welcome to the jingle for both of my podcasts. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. You can find my podcasts wherever you get your podcasts or get them from the Channel Zero Network. Channel Zero Network.